most of the people I know that tried other methods that had it, they're not here and I am. I did the phase one diet and I alkalized my body, cut out sugar, cut out dairy, gluten, soy, and I came back six months later and the cancer cells are gone. We give laboratory animals a mycotoxin made by fusarium or, or aspergillus or other molds. It's called aflatoxin. We inject laboratory animals with this aflatoxin and guess what? They all get a mycotoxicosis. That's what they get. We don't call it that, but it's what factually it is. It is a mycotoxicosis. It's now called something different. You know what it is? Cancer. I uh, received an inquiry in 2018 from one of the viewers, she's watching right now. She had lymphoma, very worried. The doctor said uh, he wanted to start chemo. She contacted me. And folks, uh, very often, sometimes I believe these cancers are misdiagnosed. I'm just gonna say it. If they weren't, then this next hour is of no value to you at all. They are. I asked her to see a doctor friend of mine in California where she lived. Uh, he used the diet, it is now called the Kaufman diet, Kaufman 1, Kaufman 2 diet, and some supplements and so forth, and he did some tests. And he wrote me one day and said, uh, have you spoken to this woman? And I said, no, not yet. Just got her updated tumor markers back, her lab report, and the oncologist is shocked. No presence of cancer. She's in total remission. She wrote me a letter and said the same thing. She's alive and well today. I think we are hyperdiagnosing bacterial infections and cancer in America today. And I believe one leads to the other. Okay? So here's what I want to do. I want to open Healthline uh, had a post. I, every few years, uh, these will come out debunking the cancer is a fungus myth. Uh, one such myth is that fungus causes cancer or that cancer cells are actually a form of fungus. Research has revealed neither to be true. That's false. That is not true. And I've written to them and I've set, told them I want to present the truth. Haven't heard back. Uh, but I want to open today by telling you something that uh, a well-known, this was a, a 19th century pastor, Charles Spurgeon once said, when asked of his faith in science, like we're being asked today, hey, follow the science, right? What is the science, folks? And here's what he said. What science would you have me follow? The science of 50 years ago? Perhaps the science of today? Or the science of 50 years from now? Think about that. We are being asked to trust with open hearts the science of today, especially when it comes to cancer and other things. Overall, cancer survival has barely changed over the past decade. Of 72 cancer therapies approved from 2002 to 2014, these therapies gave patients only 2.1 more months of life than older drugs, according to a study in a medical journal, JAMA. Two-thirds of, two of cancer drugs approved in the past two years have no evidence showing that they extend life at all. Oh, but they're approved. Okay, I want to talk to you today about a couple of things. Number one, I believe that fungi initiate cancer growth and uh, mimic cancer growth. So these are the things I want to talk about. First of all, we're going to talk about what medical doctors believe are the causes of cancer. It's really amazing. Heredity. About 5 to 10% of all cancers are thought to result directly from gene defects inherited from a parent. Gene mutations. All cancers are thought to be caused by genetic mutations, so says Medical News Today. At least 33 fungal poisons are known to induce or cause genetic mutations. And then we have the one that I want to expound on, folks, because it has to do with um, genetic fusion. The third cause of cancer, doctors are uh, saying, is genetic fusion. A hybrid gene is created by joining two portions of different genes. Those of you who have followed me on this show regularly know that I believe that COVID, uh, the Wuhan scientists stepped in bat caves, picked up a fungus called histoplasma, 
uh, transferred it over to the virus, the SARS CoV 2 virus, and the DNA from the fungus and the RNA from the virus fused. And that's why we can't figure this thing out. I believe that. Long before that, decades before, I had figured out this. And that is that I believe cancer is a genetic fusion disease. You see, our human cells and fungal cells, unlike bacteria, have something called deoxyribonucleic acid. God forbid a fungal cell would get into a human cell and create a hybrid. And I think that's where we are today. And that hybrid, because it's fungus, would metastasize. Two would become four, would become eight, etc. Okay? So genetic fusion is known to exist. Uh, many viruses, now viruses are different, but I want you to know that the way Epstein-Barr and human papilloma and, uh, and hepatitis B and C turn into cancer, they actually promote human cancers by integrating their uh, RNA or DNA into human cells. And that's pretty well known. That's published. This is the Journal of Oral Microbiology in the year 2010. Okay, so we know that genetic fusion exists. Here's what a guy named Milton White, man, it was Mother's Day 25 years ago. Uh, Dr. Beverly Hunt and I went out to visit Dr. Milton White because he had published this in a medical journal. He said, cancer is neither the result of a virus nor the consequence of an inherited gene. Cancer is a hybrid. It is due to a plant conidia or spores derived from an ascomycete or sac fungus. Okay? We believe that. We got on a plane and we went to see him. This was the most remarkable man, little short man, white hair, brilliant scientist. His wife died of breast cancer shortly before we got there. And he told us with tears in his eyes that she grabbed his arm and said, Milton, you're a smart man. Figure out cancer. And I'm telling you, this was 1996, he published this. Uh, Medical Hypotheses was the journal. Then I want to zoom forward. So I began to form my hypotheses, folks. There are, there are books like this. This is prostate cancer. There's breast cancer written by uh, three doctors, uh, mycologists, doctors with the World Health Organization. One of them became a friend of mine after I attended his conference in Canada I don't know, 1978, 1985, somewhere in there. And he wrote a bunch, they wrote three books. Atherosclerosis, they believe is due to fungus. Prostate cancer, they believe is due to fungus. Breast cancer, they believe is due to fungus. This whole book, this whole book, 450 pages, is all about fungus and the link to prostate cancer. I would like to tell you how smart I am and how important I am, but I have stood on the shoulders of giants in the past. Then came a doctor named Lazava, very nice doctor. I spoke with her out of Yale University. Um, I picked up a, a, a medical research journal one time, and the headline was How Cancer Spreads. Metastatic tumor is a hybrid of cancer cell and white blood cell. So enabling the metastasis of cancer is a cancer cell and a white blood cell. Close your eyes a minute and think if the cancer cell was a fungus cell. DNA from a fungus cell merges with DNA from a human cell, it builds a hybrid cell, a brand new cell, and it takes on all the characteristics of a fungus. Fungi hide themselves from phagocytosis, from our ability of our white blood cells to gobble them up. We get into viruses and fungi and bacteria all the time, and our immune system is launched in a type of white blood cell, a large white blood cell, called a PMN, polymorphonucleated leukocyte. Uh, it, go, it's loaded with digestive enzymes, gobbles up the debris, and renders it harmless in your body. Um, and so what these doctors were saying, our results provide for the first time in humans that cancer metastasis can occur when a leukocyte, a white blood cell, and a cancer cell fuse to form a genetic hybrid. If they were right, the research went nowhere. If 
the cancer cell was a fungal cell. Bingo. Because fungus hides from this phagocytosis, these white blood cells moving in and gobbling it up. They form in a little spongy sac that's very difficult to differentiate from a cancer tumor. And I brought this in. This was one of the lectures I gave to doctors. <clears throat> hope I did. Darn, I hope I did. I hope I did. <coughs> Excuse me. It's the similarities, uh, the similarities between cancer and fungus. They both live in a closed environment. They can live anaerobically. They don't need oxygen. They both thrive. They'll both thrive more in the presence of sugar. They'll both die in the absence of sugar. They both respond to antifungal drugs. Did you know that? I'll expound on that in a few minutes. But it's really fascinating, folks, as I, you know, as I met these giants. Uh, cancer is neither the result of a virus nor the consequence of an inherited gene. It's a hybrid due to fungus merging with human cells. Facebook's fine, but the YouTube, for some reason. Oh, okay. So thank you, John. Uh, technical issues at YouTube. Uh, they are disallowing questions at this time. Darn, I wanted you guys to ask questions about fungus and, and uh, cancer. Today's question should probably apply to to cancer. And I'm not a cancer specialist. I have seen so many of these I can't even begin to tell you. Yeah, this is Dr. Lazava. We communicated for a period of time, but she moves on. As I left this audience on Tuesday, these were the final two questions that I got. I, I get hundreds of them, as you know, each show. My fan, uh, Kim said, my family has had several members diagnosed with cancer. We no longer support the American Cancer Society because they will always be 10 years away from a cure. That's gone on, you know, for a long period of time. God bless them, folks. These aren't bad people. They're not cheaters. They're really good people who write down what the bosses tell them to write down. Well, we're probably 10 years away from a cure. Yeah, but it's 1958. Okay, 10 years away from a cure. It, there just isn't... The cure is not around the corner until you understand that what we're calling cancer may in fact be diametric to what this article says. Don't believe the myth that cancer cells are fungal cells. Okay. The other I got was, uh, Kelly asks, I have a severe systemic fungal infection. Could that lead to cancer and metastasizing cancer? Yeah, it could. I want to teach you about a word called mycotoxin. Myco means fungus. Mycology is the study of fungus. Mycotoxins are poisons made by fungi. Of the two million species that exist of fungi out there, man has classified about 75,000 of them. Of those, only 300 are pathogenic to man. You know the names, Aspergillus, Fusarium, Candida, Albicans, um, and many others. But these off-gas a poison. It's a liquid, a solid, a gas. Once inside your body, they make poisons. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about these. The International Academy for Research on Cancer has stated this. Five fungal mycotoxins are listed as possibly carcinogenic to humans. They are aquatoxin A, fumonisin B1, fumonisin B2, fusarian C, and stereomatocystin. One fungal mycotoxin is a known human carcinogen. Aflatoxin B1 causes human cancer, and it's the only mycotoxin the FDA tests for in our food supply. It's proven carcinogen. It causes human liver cancer. So that article that fungus has anything to do with cancer is wrong. I will tell you for the rest of my life, let them be wrong. Do not. You get to choose this. Do not let them be dead wrong. Okay, let's study these mycotoxins. So now we know of the hundreds of items, alcohol of any kind in our diet is a known human carcinogen. Uh, alcohol is yeast, so it makes perfect sense to me. Study these a little bit. John, do you have that list of uh, fungal mycotoxins can be? Can we put that list uh, up if you have it? These fungal mycotoxins each of the 300 known pathogenic fungi make poisons, and they can be mutagenic, tremorogenic, they cause tremors, carcinogenic, genotoxic, teratogenic, birth defects, neurotoxins, 
nephrotoxins, hepatotoxins, hematoxins, cardiotoxic, lymphotoxic, skin poisonous, immunosuppressive, uh, endocrine disruptors, embryotoxin, and uh, estrogenic. They mimic human estrogen. One of them does, and that's xerelinone in our meat and milk supply. We need to be careful, folks, with these because our doctors are not being taught this at all in medical training. Okay, so you need to know that fungal mycotoxins can be all of those. Most are immunosuppressive. Most are heat stable. They can't be burned off. You can take your pasta and break it and put it in the pan and boil it, the wheat, with mycotoxins on it. This isn't rare. Uh, with mycotoxins on it, you will burn the fungus off, but if it's deposited, it's poisons within that rice or within the rice or the, the pasta, you're going to eat those. Okay, so it's heat stable. At least 33 of these little buggers are known mutagens, known uh, DNA mut mutagens. Exposure ill effects range from annoying to life threatening. These are capable of causing human disease and death in human, uh, says the journal. Aflatoxin is one of the worst. We now know it causes human cancer. The FDA has established a maximum allowable level of this aflatoxin, but let me break it down to simple words. Uh, Aspergillus mold, two species, Parasiticus and Aspergillus uh, flavus. There's a couple species of all the species of Aspergillus that make this, and our contact with it isn't rare. It's in our grain supply. It's in some of our ducting. If you had a leak in your home, uh, have you slept in a basement, you've probably been exposed to aspergillus mold. It makes a poison called a mycotoxin, called aflatoxin B1. The FDA has called it carcinogenic. Um, the most important thing I can tell you folks is our exposure to these things come in several ways. Number one, our food supply, corn especially, peanut especially, wheat, not so bad 20 years ago, but today a problem, yes, even whole wheat. Sitting down to a bowl of cereal isn't a bad thing, folks. It's the chronic exposure. If you're living in a moldy home and you're smoking cigarettes, lots of mold in these, okay, and you're drinking alcohol, yeast, and you live a high stress life and you've been on lots of antibiotics, penicillium is the mold. The poison it makes is called penicillin. Thank God it's poison. It kills tiny bacterial organisms in very tiny doses. If we would just adhere to that doctrine, give a patient an antibiotic only when they have a bacterial infection, everybody would be winning. We aren't. Antibiotic abuse in America is rampant. We're taking lots and lots and lots and lots of antibiotics. That means we're getting a lot of mycotoxins. Penicillin is the mold. The mycotoxin it makes is called penicillin. Penicillium, penicillin, okay? Now, there's a book I want to introduce you to. This was, I was recruited and brought to Dallas in 1987 by a dermatologist out of Johns Hopkins University. This was one of his medical textbooks. Uh, folks, he had me come in for six months to prove to him that psoriasis and other skin conditions had a fungal basis. It's not something they learn in medical school. Dermatologists learn a little more. Doctors in Africa uh, learn much more about eating corn and these mycotoxins. Doctors out here uh, really don't know much about it. I want to read you in this old 1957, look at how many times I've read this, it is entitled, if you want a copy of it, Clinical and Immunologic Aspects of Fungal Diseases. Johns Hopkins University, circa 1957. J. Walter Wilson was the author. On page 11 in that book, pulmonary coccidioideomycosis, pulmonary fungus, is suggestive of metastatic malignancy. 1957? Shh, long gone, folks. Nobody talks about that anymore. Page 115, localized cutaneous blastomycosis. It's a different kind of a fungus, but a skin, cutaneous is skin. So a uh, mark on your skin is frequently mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. What? 
how many people have had Mohs procedures for squamous cell carcinomas. And yet in 1957, they ran hand in hand. Shh. Disseminated histoplasmosis, valley fever. Disseminated histoplasmosis is found to coexist with leukemia, lymphosarcoma, sarcoidosis, and Hodgkin's disease much more frequently than is statistically justifiable based on coincidence. So when you got lymphosarcoma cancer or leukemia or Hodgkin's disease and they take your blood, gee, they find histoplasma capsulatum. They find this, the same thing I think is responsible for COVID. They find this or other molds in their bloodstream. And finally, page 175, disseminated cryptococcus. Once mold gets in your body, it disseminates via your bloodstream. Closely simulates neoplasm. I'll bet you there are thousands of books that that's been glanced over. Shh, we don't know what that means. It means in 1957, they were closer than in the year 2021 to figuring cancer out. But it just flies under the radar. That one book, isn't that fascinating? Fungal infection can mimic cancer. This is published in Mycoses. Fungal infections, this isn't going to mean much to you, but I'll say it. These fungi, the diseases they cause, have big names. <clears throat> Fungal infections including paracoccidioideomycosis, histoplasmosis, cryptococcosis, coccidioideomycosis, aspergillosis, mucormycosis, and blastomycosis can mimic both the clinical, let's take some blood or a, uh, let's take a biopsy, and the radiologic findings of lung cancer. These are pretty common. These are pretty common fungi, and yet everybody's got COVID. Everybody's got lung cancer. Do they? <clears throat> this will just boggle your mind. Lung is the journal, 2013, number, issue number 199. A case series was presented of 27 patients initially diagnosed both clinically and radiologically with primary or secondary lung cancer. These later proved to be fungal infections, and all 27 patients responded well to antifungal therapy. If I had sarcoidosis, if I had COPD, if I had asthma, if I had breathing disorders, if I had lung cancer, I would demand to try antifungals. I think many, perhaps most, would be so happy. I'll never forget a course I taught. There was a doctor there, a young doctor there, who's a pulmonologist. He and I have become friends. And after I taught, I was the keynote speaker at this medical symposium on mycotoxins. He wrote me an email the next day and said, you just changed my whole world. Uh, he does bronchoscopies. And uh, folks, doctors, it's a well-known secret, but a well-known fact that many doses of antibiotics can induce many types of cancer because they're mycotoxins. They don't know that or they'd know the fungus link. Did you mention the name of that book again? Yeah. Which book, John? The, the last one that you had. Oh, you guys can't see this? <laughs> it's so bad. And look, at a dear friend sent me a new copy of it. He found it. If you can get this book, it is so valuable. You won't put it down. Clinical and immunologic aspects of fungal diseases. My binding is shot, everything is shot. J. Walter Wilson wrote this book. Look at David paid $6.75 for it at Johns Hopkins. The point I want to make, you see where I'm going here? This is the cancer, uh, this is what, American Cancer Society. They say fungus can cause cancer. Not these researchers. And folks, let me tell you the good news. I've been around 50 years in this field. I'll never forget the time that a doctor emailed me. She found me, and she talked to the, one of the television stations. The show is now global, uh, thank God. And she found me through one of the, the owners of the TV station. Her name was Dr. Arnon, and she said, you've done it. I'm sorry? My name's Dr. Arnon. I'm a pathologist. I'm a cancer pathologist. I want to send you a copy of my book. If you... If, Look, I have a few copies of this. Her, cancer, her book is called, see you guys, have a good evening, thanks for your help. Uh, her book is called, let's see if you can get that, John, Cancer, cancer Biology. 
a study of cancer pathogenesis. In other words, what starts it. Chapter 12 in her book, she highlighted it for me and sent it to me. 10, 11, chapter 10, I'm sorry, cancer and fungus, the whole chapter. She said, you've done it, you're right. I don't even know, I, I communicated with her for a year, the most wonderful woman, retired, living in Colorado, she loved the snow, just what an amazing woman, but what she taught me in her years, folks, it's not coincidental that so many doctors have contacted me and said, what do we do then with a cancer patient? There's one doctor who's written a best-selling book, and in it he includes information on me. Wish I could find that. Uh, it's humbling. I don't want to get a big head. I don't need a big head. This all comes from above. This doesn't come from me. But here's 27 patients. wonder how they chose those 27 patients. With diagnosed lung cancer, biopsy, x-ray, scans. Yep, you got lung cancer. For some reason, 27 of them were pulled together, put on Spornox, which is an antifungal drug, and uh, they got better. Why not? Should it be mandatory that every oncologist and every diagnostician ask his or her patients this? I don't like the way that looks in your throat. It looks cancerous. We're going to take a biopsy. We're going to do some blood work. But let me ask you a few questions. <clears throat> Have you ever slept in a basement? Yeah, when I was a little boy, why? It's relevant. Basements are underground. It's where mold is. Mom and dad ever have a leak in the roof? Yeah, but, you know, they got it fixed in two days. Fixing mold is a huge problem. A carpet doesn't let you fix it. A wet floor doesn't let you fix it. When you were 18, 19, 20, and taking, you're going to learn a little bit more than you want to about Doug Kaufman. When I got back from Vietnam, I overconsumed alcohol. I wasn't afraid. If I heard a car backfire, it didn't scare me. I didn't almost pass out. So alcohol helped with that. Alcohol is a mycotoxin, right? Brewer's yeast, ethanol, uh, acetaldehyde, the mycotoxin of alcohol. Um, so, yeah, okay, I drank too much when I was 21, 22, 23. Um, how many antibiotics have you been on? Oh, because I drank. Uh, I was on lots of antibiotics, okay? There's another risk factor. When you get out of the shower, Doug, what happens? Well, first, I itch like crazy. Fungus loves heat. You went in cold, you came out hot, and now you're scratching and itching. Do you crave sugar? I can't get enough. I'm going to go to the sugarologist after I'm done here, doctor. Now, why am I craving sugar? In a human fungal cell relationship, they are tremendously equal. But one becomes dominant, and it isn't the human cell. Fungus becomes dominant over human cells. What does that mean? I need to eat. Doug, I'm inside your gut, I'm inside your lungs, I'm in your colon, I'm in your kidney, and I'm hungry. I need sugar. You starve cancer with a keto diet, a very low carb, low sugar diet. You starve fungus with a diet just like that. I developed one in the 1970s, 78, 79. It's called the Kaufman diet. I'm not here to sell it. A keto diet is a, is a wonderful diet. This is what I would pray one day all doctors ask their patients. They've got to begin asking about what I call the spore score. On lots of antibiotics, drink lots of alcohol, how much is lots? American Cancer, if you can believe this, says drinking two beers. John, do you have that graphic of how much the beer and wine? They say, you know, for guys, two drinks a day is okay. Well, we did the math. For women, a glass of wine is okay. That's 58 bottles of wine in a year, ladies, when you're drinking an innocent glass of wine an evening. But for men, it's 68 gallons of beer in a year. You couldn't lift but 15 of those. That's how much you drink. Then we end up in a doc and we're all on antibiotics for anything, really. They're handed out randomly. Um, then you walk into a doctor's office, you're 68 years old, and he's saying, oh boy, mm, lymphoma, mm, Doug, I don't like this. Um, I wonder why. Well, for 10 years, I've had 680 gallons of beer. 
because you never told me not to, Doc. I eat tons of corn, but it's good corn. I love peanut butter. Oh, I happen to smoke a little. Do you see where I'm going, folks? If cancer and fungus are similar, and they are, then you see where I'm going with this. Oh boy, thanks, John. Okay, my papers here. I just want to touch on a couple things briefly. Breast cancer or breast fungus? In 1995, three breast cancer patients had fine needle aspiration done of the lump. All three were found to have different fungi in the breast lumps. One was confirmed with special fungal stains but hadn't started on the antifungal drugs yet by the time of this reporting in Diagnostic Cytopathology, 1995. The other two were started on antifungal drugs and responded favorably. None of the three had breast cancer. We are hyperdiagnosing a lump. What you have is lumpitis. What's the cause of that lump? Remember, fungi hide in a sac from white blood cells gobbling them up, but they reproduce in that sac. So the little tiny cyst you felt when you were in the shower in the morning, two months it's a little bigger. It's a little bit just like cancer tumors. They get a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. Okay, this is called fine needle aspiration. Is breast cancer always breast cancer? Primary cutaneous aspergillus fungus mimicking a malignancy. Cytopathology circa 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, when you're told you have cancer, do your research. Do your research. I've been able, oh, I've been overjoyed. I've been overjoyed. Guys, we have two safeguards. We have a Superman gene. It's called the P53 gene. It's the most studied gene in the human genome. Because if you've got a lot of this, it suppresses cancer in your body. Guess what suppresses the P53 gene? It's found in over half of all cancers. They take your P53, it's almost like a, you know, like a confirmation of your cancer. Wow, your P53 gene is way down. Guess what causes it to go way down? aspergillus mold. Aflatoxin B1 made by aspergillus is known to induce P53 mutation. So says the National Academy of Science, cancer.org. Why don't they tell the doctors this? Because they didn't, folks, this is unbelievable. By the way, how do we give, you saw on that four-year-old video, how do we give mice cancer? We inject them with aflatoxin B1, and they all get cancer. Doesn't one of those brilliant researchers go home to his or her spouse and say, honey, you're not going to believe this. 18 months ago, I gave all these bunnies something called aflatoxin B1, and 18 months later, they all got their bleeding, they got lumps all over their body, and yet we're getting into that same fungus, aspergillus mold, not rarely. We're getting into it pretty commonly. Okay, finally, I want, I want to tell you this, and then I'm going to answer your questions. Oh, I thought this was fascinating. Uh, John Pollecki, Yale Cancer, 2008. Although we know a vast amount about cancer, how cancer cells become metastatic remains a mystery. Five years later, same university, Yale. Our results provide the first proof in humans that metastasis, cancer metastasis can occur when a white blood cell and a cancer cell fuse, so genetic fusion, and form a genetic hybrid. Once again, once again, same university. You never have lunch with the right person. Somebody would have figured this out. It's not a cancer cell. What if it's a fungal cell? Well, when you put DNA from a fungal cell and DNA from a human cell, you see where I'm going, folks. You create a hybrid. And it doesn't respond. Let's take COVID. It doesn't respond to antivirals. But it is responding to a drug called colchicine, which is used for gout, which is a fungal disease. It does respond to zinc. It is responding to vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, all antifungal. I mean, fish oil, antifungal. It, it's aspirin antifungal. COVID patients are getting better with aspirin because acetylsalicylic acid kills fungus. Okay, here we have Dr. Mann, antifungal agent lowers PSA levels. 
This was 1997 in the Medical Tribune. The antifungal drug was used in combination with cortisone. It was called ketoconazole or nizerol. Just keep that in mind, guys with high PSAs. Oh, we could talk about this. This is what the PSA test really is. Is it a fungal test or is it a prostate cancer test? We'll cover that ground later. Antifungal drug stops cancer faux tumors in mice and should be investigated as a potentially cheap, just lost its funding. Potentially cheap? An easy way to fight cancer in people. Sporinox may boost the effect of other drugs. Mm, Sporinox kills fungus. They'd never admit that the cancer they induced with the mycotoxin in these mice was fungus, and yet they used a fungus to give them cancer. They're now shocked that an antifungal would help those little mice. Antifungal drug treats cancer. An inexpensive antifungal drug slows tumor growth and shows promise as chemotherapy for cancer. In trials on mice, thibendazole, thibendazole decreased blood vessel growth in fibrosarcoma tumors by more than 50%, and it slowed the growth of tumors to a crawl. Why aren't we using thibendazole in cancer patients, blood cancer? A common inexpensive antifungal medication has joined the ranks that may be suitable for use in treating metastatic prostate non-small cell uh, carcinomas as well as other cancers. The drug is called Sporinox, is FDA approved to treat skin and nail fungal conditions. Here's work on a Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, March 2016. We have just repurposed Sporinox as a cancer drug. It was invented to treat toenail fungus. It used to be $30 a bottle. What did we find out, John, now it's $500, $700 a bottle. The point is, what I want you guys to do, look, this was all about educating you. I've discovered something that's huge. 99% of my peers poo-poo all of this. Well, oh, that hasn't been proven. As you see, before I could lecture to doctors, every graphic had to be given to their board and approved. That meant it needed a scientific reference like every one of these have at the bottom before I could ever do a continuing medical education course. And it's not just cancer. I want to whet your appetite, then I'm going to go to your questions. In order to study new medicines and new procedures and new cosmetics. Gosh, I remember when I worked with Dr. Hughes at USC. One of my problems is I was so paranoid um, that I couldn't go up an elevator if people were on it. He worked on the ninth floor of the tower, so I used to walk up all the stairs. On the fifth floor, they had dogs on conveyor belts. They were putting stuff in bunnies' eyes, and I just couldn't handle that. But that was back 50 years ago. I just walked right by. Um, Folks, in order, in order to study cancer drugs or cosmetics or procedures, you need to have animals as the guinea pigs. You don't try a new, well, normally, you don't try a new unapproved drug without trying it on animals first. We broke precedence a year ago now. How do you give a rat Alzheimer's disease. Good question. You inject them, you inoculate them with a mushroom, a fungus poison called ibotenic acid, and they all get Alzheimer's symptoms. Well, wait a minute. How do you give a rat, a mouse, a bunny, you know, uh, diabetes? You inject them with one of two antibiotics, streptomycin or baflomycin. They're extremely toxic, no longer used in clinical medicine, but it's how we give bunnies diabetes. It wrecks their pancreas, their beta cells, and they all get diabetes. It's a fungus. They're fungi. They're fungal poisons called mycotoxin. Well, how do we give those bunnies cancer? Aspergillus mycotoxin. It's called aflatoxin and they all get cancer. Do you see where I'm going here? I'm curious, and I know many of the viewers of this show are also, does not one of those guys go home, crawl into bed at night, flip the TV on with his wife, and say, honey, you're not gonna believe this. Today, those, you know, bunnies, 
we confirmed it. They all have Alzheimer's symptoms. How'd you do that, Jim? Well, we gave them ibotenic acid from mushrooms. It's a mycotoxin, it's a poison made by, by fungus, yeah. Are we getting into that? You bet we are. You bet we are. We are every day. Fungi are ubiquitous. If you suffer from migraine headaches or sinus problems or your ears itch bad or they're ringing, look at your pillow. You drool, if you're anything like me, you sweat on some nights and you wake up and your pillow's a little bit damp, that forms mold. How old is your pillow? How old is your mattress? How much corn, how much beer, how much wine, how many antibiotics, how much wheat? And boy, you buy whole wheat because it's the best. Is it? That's what I've learned through the years. Now, we're going to answer some questions. Please understand I am, oh, this was good. Oh, this was good. Let me just read you this. All about feed. Folks, every year, this great group, allaboutfeed.net, they're veterinary mycologists. They study mycotoxins. Here's the survey, mycotoxin survey 2020. Let's go to Europe. Okay, in Europe, the most prevalent. Let's go to North America. Here we are, North America. Risk in North American uh, grain is extreme. Deoxynevalenol, DON, is one of the most uh, main concerns of species in North America. Senior mycologist with Biomin said, we've observed a high prevalence of DON. This is a dangerous mycotoxin. 72% of the samples were contaminated with this. Average of positive for Don in corn was quite high, 808 parts per billion, even higher in cereals. We also saw high coke contamination levels in corn. 60% of the samples were contaminated with more than one mycotoxin, fusarium, uh, distillers, grains. Look, one of my books says that, that the makers of booze will pay more for old grain, mycotoxin grain, they'll pay more for old fruit, grapes, that are already destroyed, uh, because that, now, let me just, in their defense, it seems that during the chemical process, we don't drink, we don't get a whole lot of mycotoxins, unless you're drinking a lot. How do I define that? Differently than the American heart, American lung, American cancer. I, they say that 68 gallons of beer a year is, is just okay. That's moderate drinking. Can you imagine that illogic? And yet they all say it. If they go down and say, don't drink any more alcohol, I think diabetes rates, cancer rates, heart palpitation rates, skin problem rates, depression rates will all change. Shh. You don't shoot the goose that's laying the golden eggs. Okay? Now, no, I'm not a doctor. I can't uh, diagnose. I always refer people. I have so many good friends that I've taught this through the 50 years that will see some of you guys. And like my friend who went and saw the doctor in L.A., this is now three years later. I hear from her all the time. She's doing great. She didn't have cancer. And yet we're told you have cancer. Is it cancer? Ah. Okay, uh, Cheryl, we'll start with you. Thank you, Doug. Just want to let you know I have tried olive leaf extract on my feet topically after seeing you mention it, and my foot fungus I've had for years is gone. Olive leaf is a fascinating little uh, product. Do you know in, in Egypt, in the pyramids, you know, they had these uh, mummies, and you know what they put on those mummies? You know, you always thought it was gauze they wrapped them in. It was olive leaves and the cells that they're antifungal, antibacterial, antiprotozoa, antivirus, olive leaf extract. I'm very bullish on olive leaf extract. By the way, that guy, John, that we gave his company is one of the best olive leaves. I still think it is. Um, he wrote me and thanked me. A lot of you guys must have called and uh, picked up his olive leaf. It's not expensive. What was it? Ameridin, yeah. He called me and said, thank you so much. He's not a sponsor. He was years ago. Folks, when I find a good horse, remember, I'm from Texas. When I find a good horse, I ride it. When I find a good company that I really like, even if they're not paying to advertise on my show, I'm going to tell you about them. I owe you a fiduciary obligation. I think 
many of the people watching today that are worried a loved one or they have cancer themselves, I got to tell you, think about this. Just pray on it tonight when you're in bed. Ask God. He'll, he'll lead you in the right direction, whereas I may not. Just want to let you know Olive Leaf worked. Cheryl, I'm so happy. Topically. Doug, what would you recommend for toe fungus? Claudia, I, uh, back when I was you know, working in the clinic with these doctors, I was recruited from Los Angeles to one of the big hospitals out here in uh, 1987. Man, I'm old. The kids were a little tiny at that time. We said, well, we'll sign a five-year deal. We'll go back to California. We're from Manhattan Beach where I surfed and had a ball uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, but the kids made friends. They both married Texas girls. You know, they, they now, it's so good. I, I know why we're here. I know why we're here. But I couldn't figure it out in 1987. But I helped all these doctors. On several occasions, doctors have emoted in front of me. On every occasion, I thought they were mad at me. Doug, get in my office. I thought, oh boy, what have I done this time? That's Claudia. I want you to see her chart. Look at her tumor markers. Okay, the CA19 is uh, way down. Is her lung cancer better? Here's the report. He can't find lung cancer. Um, so I'm always just thrilled that these doctors are starting to get it. Thrilled. What would I recommend for toe fungus? What I used to do. I'm not afraid of Spornox. I'm not afraid of Lamisil. These were drugs that came out in the late 80s that at the time I didn't know they would become cancer drugs um, and good cancer drugs. And most doctors probably don't even know about it. And yet they're approved. They've been repurposed. Antifungal drugs, many of them. You don't find an antibiotic that's become a cancer drug. You'll never find an antiviral pill or an anti -protein. well, you know, anti-worm we have. But you'll, you'll find plenty of antifungal drugs, and there's only a handful of them anyway, that are now repurposed or being used for cancer patients. Why doesn't one, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, why doesn't one doctor say, oh my gosh, I wonder if cancer is a fungus. Doc, before I die, it's my purpose to tell you it is so often. I don't know all the causes of cancer, but genetic fusion sure makes sense to me. DNA from our cell marries up to DNA from a cancer cell, and we got a hybrid going here. And that hybrid lives in a plastic little bubble, and it grows and grows and grows, and you hop in the shower and say, dang, um, this thing's, I better, if you're a guy, you wait three years, right? Um, this thing's getting huge, I better go to a doctor. And the doctor will do a biopsy, and the biopsy will say cancer. That's what confuses me. What our lab techs learning is cancer. I've often wondered, John, if you took mushrooms and squeezed them all together in a mortar and pestle and sent it over to a diagnostic lab, if they would say cancer. You know, I don't know. Mix in some of my blood cells with mushroom and send it off to a lab and see if it came back cancer. I don't recommend that. But I do have lab techs who believe me, which is exciting. So I would recommend tea tree oil, or better yet, Vicks VapoRub for your toenail fungus. Now, the difference between Lamisil and Spornox prescription drugs and tea tree oil, or Melaleuca, uh, and, uh, uh, and Vicks VapoRub is it's gonna take longer. If you're not in a hurry and you're worried about the side effects of drugs, these antifungal drugs purport to have hepatotoxic reactions, liver toxic reactions. I never saw that. And we were writing prescriptions, lots of them, every day for antifungal drugs. We never saw one of them. I don't know what's going on with antifungal drugs. I like them. But Vicks VapoRub is camphor oils, which are what? Thank you, antifungal. So that's what I would use. Um, Cancer-free since 2013, thanks to Know the Cause. Thank you for teaching us. Wow. Sometimes you just want to cry. Kristen handed me, John, as I was leaving the office today, she handed me this and said, you got to see these. Listen to this, guys. Thank you, Beth. Uh, 
I put my stage one GYN cancer into remission with natural alternative treatments, antifungals, a plant-based diet, etc. As a registered nurse for 40 years, I, refu I refused surgery, chemo, and radiation. It just, uh, this, oh, I know, I remember her. Doug, I've been on your diet for 13 years now. I had breast cancer, no recurrence at all. I almost never get sick. I feel really good. All, these are all cancers, all these folks. I healed myself from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma doing Doug's diet 15 years ago. Um, wow, cervical cancer. In 2005, I'm convinced beta-glucan in your diet keeps the HPV at bay. I have had no recurrence for 15 years. Look, obviously I could go on and on and on and on. I'm, this is not meant, and don't think it is, to praise my work. I have stood on the shoulders of giants in this field. I'm the kind of guy I saw in the New York Times years ago that the man who discovered the PSA test said it was a fraud. I've always believed it was a fraud. And you know what I did? Took a little doing, but I got his name, and I Googled it, and I Googled and Googled and Googled and LinkedIn and found him and uh, invited him on to my show. In 1970, when I was in Vietnam, he discovered uh, uh, the enzyme, uh, which he called prostates. He didn't. He didn't know, you know, he said it really had no purpose. But it was picked up by big tech and turned into what he calls, uh, here it is. Here, John, show this book. Dick Ablin, Richard Ablin. Um, there's his name at the bottom. Let me read you what that says. It's called Every Man and Every Woman Who Loves a Man Needs to Get This Book. This Needs to Be on Your Shelf. How Big Medicine Hijacked the PSA Test and Caused a Public Health Disaster. And he names names. And nothing will ever be done to these people. They made billions of dollars. Okay, I need to be on, on their side a little bit more. They probably thought he had invented a blood test for prostate cancer. Let me tell you what this book talks about. The PSA approved, uh, the PSA, the FDA, I get my acronyms, the FDA approved the PSA test based on this. Your digital rectal exam is 1.3% accurate. If you had 100 men standing here with prostate cancer, the digital rectal exam is, it would find one of them. Well, we need something more accurate than that. The new PSA test was 3% accurate. Can you believe, men, that we have done that? I haven't. I've never had a, a PSA or any of that. I've never been to a urologist. I found my way out of doctor's visits, medications, and so forth many years ago, many, many years ago. Do take a look at this book. He's an awesome guy, and he told his story. Uh, so thank you, uh, Beth. Really good testimonial. Uh, Wendy says, quick question, keto or not to keto? Been a while since I've been uh, on here, but I'm sure you have talked about it. Good to hear your voice. Wendy, thank you so much. A, a friend of mine, Alan North, has developed a product, and I know the money he borrowed from his brother <laughs> to develop this product. I watched him develop it. Alan came into my office seven years ago and said, I'm ticked off. I went to the health food store, I want to follow the keto. I read a book on keto and cancer, and I really want to follow this diet. He didn't have cancer, but he wanted to lose a lot of weight and feel good. And he said, look, Doug, and he starts laying bars and you know, keto packages, flour on my desk. And he said, look at this. It, it's not keto at all. Look at the sugars in this. Corn sweeteners, look at, folks. There are products on the market that I wouldn't get close to. But this is all I've done professionally my whole life. Wendy, if you can find, look up KetoMed, K-E-T-O, KetoMed.com. He has since developed a couple of other products. Um, he's got a CBD hemp that uh, last night before I went to bed, oh, um, I took a dropper full of this under my tongue. I went to sleep like this, and I woke up at 6.13 this morning just like this. It is wonderful. Uh, so KetoMed, K-E-T-O-Med.com. He has a real, the real tamale, the real keto 
diet in liquid form. You mix a scoop of it, shake it up, drink it down. And if I had cancer, that's one, I would follow a keto diet, no doubt in my mind. Remember, sugar feeds cancer. Oh, by the by, sugar feeds fungus. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you, Wendy. Good to have you back with us. Good, thank you, John. Doug, I got fluconazole, that's diaphragm. The doctors now, here's another clue. Ladies, how many of you have taken rounds of antibiotics and end up with a vaginal yeast infection? To wit, they give you another drug. It, it's the way doctors think, you gotta be drugged. So you get three rounds of antibiotics, you got a bad vaginal yeast infection, the nurse will call in one pill, a 150 milligram fluconazole, the AIDS treatment, um, and, uh, and it works. We used to give, uh, Dr., uh, the, all three of them, used to give 200 milligrams of this drug, fluconazole, twice a day, one in the morning. No, that's not true. That was for, uh, that was for deep mycotic oral growth that we saw in a couple of patients. Um, they used to use it once a day for 14 days. The half-life of it, as I recall, 200 milligram was a day. And you have to know this, guys, 150 milligram, a day for 14 days is what the doctors would have probably given. You have to know this. If you're following my diet, the Kaufman One diet, which is a, you know, starve the yeast, starve the fungus, and you're taking an antifungal, what these patients told me from 1986 to 1991 when he died, such a good man, he died, um, but they told me in three or four days, taking Diflucan or Spornox, antifungal drugs and my diet, you'd starve it and treat it, kill it, kill it and starve it. Um, the, within three to five days, they started feeling the best they've ever felt. You don't cure a systemic fungal in infection or uh, pseudo cancer uh, caused by fungus uh, in four days. It can take a year, but more of the same should really help. Good questions. Thank you all. Does Aricept, Darlene, I don't know. Um, I always rely on PubMed. The question is, does Aricept or other Alzheimer's meds have antifungal properties? John, they found a pill that seems to help, you know, um, I'm sorry, they found a blood test that can early diagnose Alzheimer's. I started looking it up and uh, it's an enzyme and some of them are plant antifungal. It, they're never gonna get it. They're never going to get it. Does Aricep, if it helps, anything I have found that helps generally kills fungus. Yeah. Cheryl, I have lymph node uh, issues. Should I start drinking my olive leaf extract? Look, do you know what lymph massage is? There's a friend of mine who's an oncologist who orders lymph massage for all his breast cancer patients, and he's getting some interesting results. Um, so look into lymph massage. It may hurt a little initially, but you got to get that stuff out of your body. Drinking olive leaf extract? A lot of people take it that way. Hope that helps, Cheryl. Um, if Aricep helps with Alzheimer's, based on what I know, and I've, I've lectured uh, on this, on neurological diseases, and they're linked to fungal mycotoxins. Uh, it, it, then it may have antifungal properties. Go to pubmed.org, type in the generic name of Aricep, and then antifungal or antimycotic, and see if a few papers pop up. Esther, this is priceless. Just wanted to let you know that when I was a kid, my grandpa gave me garlic necklace against parasites or bugs in my stomach. I didn't know what it was, I just wore it. <laughs> Your grandpa was a smart guy. 3,000 years ago, we heard from the father of medicine, Hippocrates. Let food be your medicine, and medicine your food. You know, you guys, as I study this, you'll pick up medical books, microbiology, which doctors take in their medical training, and you'll see this much about bacteriology, because every, well, there are a thousand antibiotics they got to sell. You'll see this much about virology and that much about mycology or the study of fungus. Then you pick up a Bible and it says at least 30, first of all, the name 
bacteria or, or virus doesn't exist, but fungus and leavening and yeast, and they're all, except one in Mark, they're all derogatory. Don't be like the yeast of the Pharisees. So you hold up a medical book, almost no information on fungus. And then you hold up the Bible, brittled with it. Make sure that bread is unleavened, right? Yeast is a bad thing. Yeast was analogous, according to some people, to sin in, in the uh, Old Testament. And I just got to tell you, which way do you go? And then doctors are saying, well, we don't know what causes cancer. Here's this guy. Although we know a lot about cancer, you do? How cancer cells become metastatic still remains a mystery. You don't know a lot about cancer. You know a lot of big names, but you don't know a lot about cancer. Or this might help you. Um, that's priceless, Esther. Thank you so much. Mycotoxicosis. It is what they're calling cancer. If we it were mammals, just like a dog, just like you know animals, if we can induce cancer with aspergillus mold, which we do, well documented in the scientific literature. We've got to give these animals cancer, so let's give them aflatoxin made by aspergillus fungus. That's the only thing that makes it. Then you just hit it. Why is it, as I said in the opening of today's show, when I was wearing that dark shirt and I was five years younger, we give all these animals chronic mycotoxicosis because we injected, fus we injected fusarium or, or, or penicillium or aspergillus mold in them. They didn't get cancer. And yet he reports back in 18 months after inoculating, okay, they all got cancer. They all got lumps. They're all bleeding. They're all falling apart. Go ahead and study your drugs. They didn't get cancer. They got a chronic mycotoxicosis. I've got to beg that question to all of you. Are these breast cancers? Especially when rarely a doctor will put a small gauge, 26 needle, 26 gauge needle into a breast and suction out some liquid, put it on a petri dish, and it grows mold? And if he'll put them on an antifungal drug, they don't know about diet, doctors generally, but if they'll put them on a diet like mine, and the cancer clears up, was it cancer at all? The king's clothes. Mycotoxicosis, and they're calling it cancer, I think. They are in animals. Okay, so Debbie, thank you. My adult daughter has tried everything to get rid of a rash around lips that won't go away. Um, it's not proleche, right? It's not right here in the cracks around the lips, okay? To get rid of a rash around the lips and it won't go away. Proleche is, uh, you know, in my humble opinion, a fungal condition. Been on Diflucan for a few weeks and it has helped, but it's not totally gone. 150 milligrams every three days. Would you go stronger or try a different antifungal? Uh, we're having to tell the doctor what she needs. I would ask the doctor, okay, it's helped. First of all, would you do me a favor and get a bottle of Time Out, T-H-Y-M-E. I should have started that company. All it is is dilute thyme oil, the spice. Huge antifungal. Costs, you know, 15, 16, 17 bucks. Put on a cotton pad and before she goes to bed in the evening, Clean her face, blow dry this area, and then put a thin layer of thyme out, T-H-Y-M-E, thyme out. Uh, it's, uh, ask the doctor if she could go to 150 milligrams of Diflucan a day for five days and see if that doesn't help it also. Good questions, you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, Shahuba, my friend. Okay, good afternoon, Doug. We know that Johnson Johnson has been granted emergency use authorization as efficacy between 67 and 72 percent for moderate cases, 85 percent for severe, and 100 percent with eliminating deaths. How do you have a higher efficacy percentage for more extreme cases and lower efficacy percentage uh, for less severe? <laughs> My sense tells me it should be the opposite. Oh boy, Shahuba, I'll try and answer you tonight. Um, in my humble opinion, this is a pretty dark time in America. And uh, I, I am a, 
I'm watching marketing just amazed. I'm watching marketing just amazed. So I'll try and answer that tonight. Thank you. I want to stay on uh, fungus and cancer. Hey, Doug, went to a doctor for forehead pain, eye pain, and now ears clogged. Doctor treats me for sinusitis, but meds didn't work. Any suggestions? Perfect question. Thank you. The US FDA is, or, I'm sorry, the Center for Disease Control in the US has posted for the last four or five years, if you're not getting better on the medication, shh, what they're saying is if antibiotics aren't working, tell your doctor to think fungus. Chronic sinusitis, according to Mayo Clinic on 9999, 1999, is all wrong, 96% fungus. And yet somebody puts you on an antibiotic. When a doctor hears itis or infection, you're going to get an antibiotic. Whereas I believe most of you or many of you need an antifungal. Doctors don't know about that yet. They didn't learn that in their medical training. Okay? Ask your doctor kindly. On my website, I have a two-pager you can print off that teaches the doctor about fungus. And I reference the Center for Disease Control and other research papers. Uh, getting started, go down to Doctor's Fungal Protocol, print off the two pages, take it to your doctor, and say, I'd like to get off the antibiotics. There it is. Thanks, John. Doctor's Fungal Protocol, and there's the two pages. You can just punch that button, and there they are. Print that off, take it to your doctor, and ask him for antifungals, like we're talking, Spornox, Diplocan. Um, so they found 16 different types of fungus. If it were yeast, I'd tell you, look at Diflucan. If it's more fungi, and the difference, folks, is yeast are single-celled, fungi are multi-celled, okay? Uh, if it's multi, I'd say Spornox. Uh, but ask for an antifungal. <laughs> Justin, my friend Justin, cancer doesn't exist. Fungus does, though. Look, I'm going through this same thing with COVID that we're going through with cancer. We're such brilliant diagnosticians, aren't we? although we know a lot about cancer. S 50,000 people a month die just in America from cancer. May I repeat this, doctor? Although we know a lot about cancer, you're good. Um, and don't get me started on these other things. Um, I was diagnosed with TB, uh, TNBC. I don't know what that is. You guys always write me in parables. You always write me in uh, acronyms. I don't know what all these diseases are. I was diagnosed with TNBC, and I feel certain I have candida overgrowth, probably parasites. This is really an interesting link. Whatever TNBC is, if you also have candida, it may be contributing to TNBC. Uh, do Dick Roy, thank you. Somebody had to ask this. Any more, folks, the big study, the last five years of lectures I watch, is mitochondria. Since we can't fix anything, you can't fix the cytoplasm, you can't fix the nucleus or the DNA and the RNA within the cell wall, then let's turn to something else. What's that one that starts with an M that gives us power? Mitochondria. One physician asked me this question, Roy, do mycotoxins damage the mitochondria? They damage everything. They'll annihilate your health and then kill you. So yes, they do. It's very well published. They do. And yet, what are we doing? Uh, you know, we're, we're going to mitochondrial specialists. To me, it's like infertility. Did you know that certain mycotoxins that are very commonly in our air and our food supply decrease sperm count dramatically? We shake the finger at the woman. Well, your eggs are... No. And so in America, we have opened up thousands of infertility. I'm going to harvest your eggs, mix them, shake them up with the sperm, and you're going to have a you know, baby. Infertility and fungus. Uh, mitochondrial damage and fungus. Roy, you're a sharp guy. Thank you. Vicki, uh, if I understand you correctly, Doug, if you have a gut and a bloodstream fungal infection, you need both Nystatin and Spornox at the same time to cover both places. Uh, yeah, gut, uh, gut fungal conditions respond favorably to a 70-year-old drug called Nystatin. It was invented by doctors Hazen and Brown in Albany, New York, hence the name, New York State Inn. 
Isn't that interesting? That's how they named drugs back then. There were two women who invented the most important drug, I think, ever. There are no side effects to it. It's called Nystatin. Um, and boy, does it work. That's a gut antifungal. The others are, let me differentiate. <clears throat> a fungistatin stops fungal growth. A fungicidal kills fungus. Fungicidals are rare, but enough nystatin leaking through the gut becomes fungicidal. Don't take too much because the die-off associated with that little pill are amazing. But yeah, you've got it right. <laughs> Steve, did you read Steve? Steve is, I want to meet this man sometime. He's come by the studio here and I haven't been here. Uh, he's one of America's finest. This guy drives trucks, he sends pictures from snow, sunsets, mountain caps, volcanoes. He's amazing. He said, Doug, I asked the doctor about an eye pain I get every time I drink coffee. He told me to take the spoon out of the cup. <laughs> uh, always blow my mind. Um, okay, Kathy says, by the way, I posted Kathy's, uh, uh, this is the most amazing, I just, first time I saw it, it's not long, it's a video, she was speaking to other people who understood mold. She had a serious mold problem, I mean chronic fatigue and so forth. It's on my website, you can go to it, Kathleen. I had the start of COPD and asthma. The pulmonologists have no idea. They would not believe that it was mold. They never will. It just amazes me. Folks, in medicine, we're in, we've got problems right now. Why aren't they teaching that antibiotics can induce cancer? Why isn't the International Cancer Registry, which talks about known carcinogens, the word antibiotic doesn't appear on it. And yet, it's pretty well documented, right? Most doctors know. Too many antibiotics may cause cancer. They don't know why, and that's because antibiotics are mycotoxins, fungal poisons. But thank you, Kathy. It's a good, you know, boy, man. Wendy says, suggestions on antifungal medicine for colon cancer, bladder, chronic bladder infection from a friend with diabetes. Is keto Kaufman diet okay for diabetics? Always check with their endocrinologist, but um, uh, there have been many books written on keto. You know, okay, there's a word called ketoacidosis and a word called ketogenic. Ketoacidosis is what type 1 diabetic patients get and it can kill them. They go into a broken state and it can kill them. So when a doctor, an endocrinologist hears keto, no, no, stay away from that. Not the ketogenic diet or ketosis that you're put into when you're eating your own fat instead of using sugar for energy, right? Ketosis. Oh, Pam, thank you. So. Uh, this is a new sponsor of ours, CV Sciences. My good friend uh, who helps run this company, one of the vice presidents, um, immune system booster, a CV defense, and then everybody ought to keep this at home. This is called CV Acute. It's a combination of skullcap and two other herbs that you take a teaspoon of. Those of you who want to boost your immune system, you've got to try beta-glucan. This is coming to you free. Just call, you know, can you put the link of both these companies, CV Sciences and NSC? I take both these products for immunity. I'm concerned about my immune system as I age. Uh, so Pam said, I've tried the CV Acute. This is like $35. If you take a teaspoon, it tastes great. Uh, and you take it for a few days. And my chest feels so much better. Really glad to hear that, Pam. Thank you. Strong natural antifungals, please, asked Dave. <clears throat> a lauric acid, a coconut oil fatty acids. When I say fatty acids, like omega-3 fatty, I mean antifungal. Okay, yeah, omega-3. Gee, how does it strengthen elasticity? How does it help prevent heart disease? Kills fungus. Okay, so strong natural antifungals, caprylic acid, uh, apple cider vinegar, uh, resveratrol, uh, vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, 
niacin, vitamin B3, most of the B vitamins. So take a B, um, a multi-B every day. You know, when you're taking a, a multivitamin zinc, you're swallowing an antifungal. And you're eating green leafy vegetables, bam, bam, bam. Antimycotic, antifungal, send it off, ta-da. So it proves to me nothing wrong. Oh, my cholesterol's always been high. Um, don't get me started on cholesterol. My cholesterol's always been 230, 225. And uh, he said, you know, I'm duty bound to tell you about statins. And I said, can I leave while you're talking? Uh, at any rate, uh, Dave, those are the strong, look, good, wholesome, pure, organic, non-GMO foods and great supplements. Antifungal, antifungal, antifungal. These are so good. Uh, Doug, will CBD oil help with nerve pain from a hermi hermi herniated disc? This is where I love Darcy Brunk. Um, I got to talk, Darcy is a chiropractor who's local here in Dallas. And he advertises on my show and he's been getting the most interesting people. He and some doctor, friends of his, have started a, uh, a stem cell clinic. I had my problems with stem cells. Number one, aborted fetuses, I'm not in. I'm never going to advertise for you. Uh, number two, when you look online, 12,000 bucks for a stem cell, I'm not interested. So uh, Darcy and I met a few times. He's become a friend of mine. If I had a herniated disc, I'd probably, you guys, I think between anti-inflammatories, be they Tylenol or resveratrol or garlic, and major surgery, there's a middle road. And that's when you want to look at stem cells taken from cord blood, not from aborted fetuses, from cord blood. And that's what Dr. Brunk does. John, put his number up. People, he's so good about talking to people on, uh, on the phone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sandy, I like what you're doing. Skin brushing, milk thistle. Uh, yeah, milk thistle, really good. I didn't know what it was till I got to Texas and we bought a little ranch for the kids and next to it was a 50 acre ranch with cows on it and I'd see these cows, I made friends with them. You can go over and talk to cows, I was always afraid of them. And they always had this white stuff and uh, the owner uh, told me that they eat this plant which is white, it's milk thistle to keep their livers. It's amazing, it's just amazing. Uh, Joyce has a great question. My friend has precancerous. We don't know what cancer is. What is precancer? My friend has precancerous spots on her pancreas. What would you recommend? Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Joyce, this is where diet plays such a role. We haven't been taught that, you guys. I grew up in a generation where fast food started, and mom and dad didn't have a lot of money. God bless them, the greatest, the salt of the earth. But we ate a lot of fast foods. Either it was in a bucket or, you know, a, a mom would buy these, these uh, cans of soda pop for, I remember, eight cents a piece. She could get a case of them. And uh, if you always do what you've always done, Joyce's friend has just been diagnosed with the scary precancerous lesions. Fungi make lesions. Did you know that? It's well published. Fungus makes lumps. Um, if I had this, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. Change. Just those few letters. Change is in the wind. You need to consider, okay, I need to start juicing with spinach and kale and a half a clove of garlic, you know, and some carrots, organic, vitamin D, vitamin A carrots. Um, I need to, I need to change. I'm going to juice with that. Then for dinner, I'm going to have a grass-fed piece of meat. I'm going to have a non-corn chicken breast. This is the way I eat. And I feel better at 71 than I did at 31, back in my drinking days. You guys, I've got a, a if you use strong antifungal, must you use a probiotic? No, Susan. Uh, if you use strong antibiotics, I would always use a probiotic. Probiotics replace the bacteria in the gut. Can fungus cause ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease or related diseases? Yeah, Jack, like MS. Uh, Dr. Dave Holland and I one time wrote, we were one of the first posters on Joe Mercola, a friend of mine on his website many years ago. Um, 
and it's called, you can find it anywhere, just type into a search engine, MS, a chronic mycotoxicosis, like I think cancer, and many diabetics, and many other health problems are chronic mycotoxicosis. MS, a chronic mycotoxicosis, question mark. It'll pop up from 2003 or whenever we wrote that. I have enjoyed this. Thank you for being with me. If you have cancer, work with a, with a doctor. Put a bug in his or her ear. Don't ask, could this be a fungus? They didn't learn that. Now that Sporinox, a toenail fungus drug, has been approved for cancer, can we try some of that? That's FDA approved. That'll make sense to him. God bless you guys. I'll see you Tuesday at 3 o'clock. Come on back.